All right, turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 46, and as is normal here, the scripture will be on the screen, but we've been progressing through, I haven't asked this question in a while, so uh, we've been, you know, we're getting just over halfway through our reading through, or close to halfway, I guess, through reading through the Bible in 2021, so I hope that things are going well, and if if uh, you are just joining now, go ahead and do that and pick up where you are. Um, if you uh, had stuff happen in your life that's caused you to maybe not be up to where we're at, then jump back in. And, uh, and so we're digging into the Psalms for quite a bit. You're going to be in them for quite a while. And as someone said the other day to me, they're not, it's hard to read 100, 100 plus Psalms in a row without having some other pieces in there, but stick with it. Bear with it. Bear the burden uh, this morning and, and over the next few weeks as we're digging into to the words of David and the other psalm writers. So, Psalm 46, verse 1. We read, God is our refuge and strength in ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and its mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations... He has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So each week... Uh, one of the things that I like to incorporate into my message, and I know that you've gotten familiar with it now, is my sermon in a sentence. And it is my summary statement so that when you leave and someone asks you about Sunday or what was talked about or you have an opportunity to minister to someone, you can go back to this because my stories are my own and so you probably are not likely to remember them or cherish them as much as I do. But... With that said, my sermon in a sentence this week is this. Though the refuge we attempt to find in this lifetime may be temporary, we rejoice that in God we find refuge that lasts forever. Now, one of the great hymns was written by Martin Luther, and it was based on this psalm. It's entitled, A Mighty Fortress is My God. And you can hear, if you go back, I'd encourage you to do that, either pick up a hymnal later or look it up online and read through the lyrics. You can hear the magnificent courage of this preacher, the courage that he displayed before a religious council that had put him on trial. They had told him that he needed to retract some things from his preaching. And he said to them, I cannot and will not retract anything. It is neither wise nor right to do anything against conscience. Here I stand, God help me, I cannot do otherwise. But even a man who had this courage in this time sometimes found that his courage failed as well. And each time that he would find his courage failing, he would turn to his friend and say, Come, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. And then they would sing. And so I think I put the, oh, maybe I didn't put them up there this morning. I intended to originally. But So here are the lyrics from that song. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal, 
did we in our own strength confide. Our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing, dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, his name, from age to age the same. And we must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him, that word above all earthly powers. No thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Now we don't know exactly what it was that caused Luther to write this song. We have some ideas, but not entirely. But since we do know that this song is based on the 46th Psalm, which understandably was his favorite, we can maybe take a guess. And so we're going to try to do that here. We imagine, I imagine that a situation that maybe best fits what Luther was considering was the deliverance of Jerusalem that took place back in the days of Hezekiah the king. So think back to that story, if it's a story you're familiar with, but it's a time where when Hezekiah as king, he has Sennacherib's forces on his doorstep. He doesn't know, he, he does what most would do in that situation and, and uh, is very concerned, and he calls in his... Uh, his helpers, his, inter, his, his, uh, his wisdom gatherers, and he seeks their advice. But miraculously, we find later in the story that an angel of the Lord comes and miraculously, miraculously kills 185,000 Assyrians. The Psalm 46 encourages us to hope and trust in God and that his power and his providence and his presence will help us through even the worst of times. And it directs us to give glory to him for all that he has done and the things that he will do in the future. I think about even the words that were said just a few minutes ago in our testimonies about looking back to the things that have happened in the past and how Maybe those words that, you, that those of you that shared this morning share may just be the words someone needed to hear today, but they may also be the very thing that becomes a source of strength months from now that we don't even really comprehend. But God also directs us to give him the glory for all that he has done now and in the future. So, in the presence, I think of all that Marcy endured over the last few weeks, you know, to be able to give glory to God, as I heard you say, that God is at work. God knew this was going to happen. God is in control of all that happens. So my message today, we're going to focus on three attributes of God. And so these, it's done in three parts. The first one is this. I want to focus on, in this passage, for the sufficiency of God. And we have this incredibly wonderful promise that we find in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I imagine that many of you have quoted this verse to yourself when you find yourself in places of, of desperation and need. Now, we can be very confident that God will be there. He will be our refuge when things get troublesome. Now, during this time that I referenced with Hezekiah, and obviously many other times too, 
Israel was in trouble with her neighbors. But while other nations, their response was that they were going to boast large armies and they were going to boast impenetrable walls perched up high on cliffs so that they would be protected, making sure to have secure iron gates protected by fierce warriors, Israel was in even a safer position than this because God was their refuge and strength. And therefore, Israel could be confident that regardless of the situation, they knew that the one true God was in their midst. But that was several thousand years ago, and so someone may ask, but how do you know that that's still true today? That God is our refuge today? Maybe that was just some promise from the past. Well, firstly, I'm going to say it's true because the Bible tells us it is. But it's more than just theoretical words to me as well. I've tried this and found it to be true. I have found times of trouble, and it was God who gave me the strength. He was the only one who could help me through the troubles that I have faced. Now back 12 Psalms, the Psalm 34, one of my favorite passages in the Psalms, we read, it says, taste and see. I think this is, I didn't write it down. I think it's verse 8. It's probably up there on the screen. But taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I love that. The taste. We all love to taste things. We love to taste our favorite things. You know, we, we were really excited two, two weeks ago when we were able to find the strawberry patch, had a few a day's worth of strawberries so that we could get some and get that taste of what real, fresh, new strawberries taste like again. It's really, he, God wants us to, to explore it with our senses. He's not just saying, take it because I said so alone. Go ahead and, and, and test it a little bit. And see if you can find something better. He's confident because he knows us. He knows what is best. In times of trouble, you can trust and count on God. When things are changing or threatening you, focus your attention on God. I don't know why that's going on. Apparently that means Zoom's not working today. So, sorry about that. Um, get me back to my spot here in a second. Because he is with you. He is your present, or he is present in you because you have his spirit living in you. Now I'm going to pause for just a second on this spot because I've heard this said many times and I want to emphasize this again. People want to lift up the Peters and the Pauls, and yes, they were great individuals But the spirit that is in them, or was in them, is the same spirit that lives in you. So if you find yourself saying, well, I'm not like Paul, or I'm not like Peter, the answer is, yes, you are. They had their own shortcomings that theirs were put on public display that over the generations, you know, that we know what Peter had struggles with. But we know that what changed in their lives was when the Spirit came in. He empowered them. He gave them the boldness. He was the change in their lives. And we know that when Christ comes into ours, we have access to the same Spirit. He is our refuge because we have His protection. And he helps you because of his power. Now this might be another point where some questions might be asked. Or where I would ask some questions. Are you depressed by troubles? Is there something that's going on in your life right now that just is all-consuming and it just seems like a mountain that you you can't imagine getting over the hills to even get up to the mountain, let alone getting over the mountain. It just seems so overwhelming to you. 
But remember, you don't have to do this on your own. God will be your strength. And it is through him that he allows us to bear our burdens. Because he puts the strength in us. Are you suffering in any way? Because he can help you. He will give you what you need. As I've said, he is present in you. He knows everything you need before you know it, and even to a greater level than what you can acknowledge. He is a helper who is tried and proven and reliable. And you don't have to look for him. He's always right there. He's sufficient to handle the problems of your life. In fact, I don't think, and I know, but I, I'll give you, I'm so confident in this that if someone finds someone better, they can tell me, you won't find better help for the issues that life throws at you. So you don't have to be afraid of the power of hell or of even the hell that we experience sometimes on this earth. Romans 8.31 If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can do us any harm? So therefore, let us keep close to God, and we will have no reason to fear. But, yeah, but, right? Yeah, but. All too often, when we put this into the practical realm, and I see all too quickly how we begin to doubt what God really promises. Did he really say this? Does he really mean this? Does he mean this in my own life? Or is it just for person A, B, or C who told me the story? Do these things actually happen? Or, you know what, maybe we should just, man, let's just do it myself. I think I can handle this better if I just do this. You know, I don't need to wait for an answer. I can just take the bull by the horns and deal with it. But what I find, and I, I've had that same experience all too often in, in my own life, is that I have come to a moment in my, time, in my life where I doubt the sufficiency of Christ. Can he do what he has said he will do? Will he do it? We need a God who doesn't fail us. And every time I've tried to play God in my own life, I've failed miserably. We need a God who is sufficient in any circumstances. And that he never fails at anything. Now most people, when we get into trouble, it consumes our lives and we, get, we, we, we focus inward uh, to the point where it's very difficult to, to recognize that, hey, you know what? Other people are still having a lot of trouble. There's still a lot of trouble out there, but man, this trouble seems really great internally, and we can't seem to move past that. We need a God who can see and is not control, or who is not overwhelmed by one person's problems. We need a God who can handle the things that come our way. We need a God who can understand our weaknesses. And we know we have that. Jesus told us that we have a God through Christ who can empathize and knows exactly what we are experiencing. God is our refuge and strength. He is our present help when we are in trouble. If you find yourself doubting this at this point in your life because of things that have happened, I'll just say this. Men throughout the ages, have, and women too, have felt this very thought. But men and women throughout the ages have experienced and found this to be true, that God is sufficient. God is a trustworthy refuge and strength. It didn't end several thousand years ago with Hezekiah. It didn't end when Jesus died on the cross. It's still going now and forever. Secondly, God, uh, part two is the, the message of God's security. 
In verse 4, we read that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, in this story that I referenced about Hezekiah, the city of God, Jerusalem, was being threatened by neighboring nations. But the, but the people were calmly trusting God for their protection. Have you ever been around someone where maybe it's not a physical death that they're worried about, but that you know they, they're willing to tell you, here's the trouble that lays out there, and they just keep going maybe on and on and on. You're like, man, how in the world are you so calm about this? I'm freaking out, and it's not even my story. How are you able to remain composed in all of this? And the answer is that ever since the Garden of Eden, God has provided, he's always had a river to bring peace to his own. It is the river that we use, we call it God's grace. The writer of the psalm, Psalm 46, is so certain that God's grace will bring about victory that he exclaims, God will help her. He doesn't say, let's go out and round up some other large armies, or let's train the troops a little bit more, or let's just send the best we have out there and hope for whatever happens. He says, no, God will help her. Friends, God is powerful. I don't think we have any idea truly how powerful he is. So just think for a minute about a few of the things he's done, things that we've already looked at or that you've read about just this year. He spoke and the world came into existence. How many of you have done that? He raised Jesus from the dead. He maintains what he created so that we can be certain that the sun will rise every morning. And that the earth will circle around the sun. God has countless angels at his command. And he made a covenant with mankind to be our refuge. That if we live righteously, and I love, love, love that song that we sang this morning, Seek ye first. What are we to seek after first? Righteousness. Seek after righteousness and all else will be added. This river of grace constantly is flowing from God to us. But I also believe that this river that's being referred to is a supply of refreshment. And that refreshment that is so desperately needed in the life of a believer is the Word of God. In Psalm chapter 1, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. We, we were told that the blessed man is the one who plants himself near the rivers of the water, which is the word of God. We ground ourselves. That is to be our refreshment. The scriptures also reference a river that flows out of the house of God in Ezekiel chapter 47. And in the book of Revelation we read that John saw a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. God is powerful, and he gives us his grace and his word so that we may have peace and that we may be refreshed. And when we are in trouble, he is our refuge. And again, I say, if God is for us, if God is with us, we don't need to be afraid of even the most violent attempts made against us. If God is in our hearts, in the midst of us, by his word dwelling richly in us, we will be sheltered. We will be helped. Therefore, let us trust God and not be afraid. Because all is well and all will end well, we are secure, and we can feel secure because God is our security. And finally, we focus on the supremacy of God. Now, all of the great and wonderful things that God has done 
ought to tell God that there is a God, right? We've got tons of evidence from the past, and we can even look at Romans that tells us, you know, we just have to look around us to acknowledge that there is a God. And yet some still deny it. Now, at the beginning of this story of Hezekiah, this 185,000 strong army had surrounded Jerusalem. And we actually, I preached off of this a while ago. And the people were behind the wall. They're in the city starving. You guys remember some of what they were doing? They got to a point where I referenced this in a message where two women were talking about having sacrificed or killed one of their, their kids and cannibalizing them. That's desperation for hunger. And then we read, I didn't include this, but to go back, this has been several months to tie it back together. Remember those individuals who had really nothing to lose by it decide, yeah, you know what, we could die here or we could die out there. So let's go out there and, and take the gamble that God will protect us. To trust that God would do that. And overnight, what did they find? The entire army was gone. In Psalm 46, verse 8, we read, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. So when the morning light broke, the citizens of Jerusalem were excited. The people, they were invited to go and witness what God had done. That they could see it with their own eyes the great power and supremacy of Christ. God had destroyed that complete army. This was the greatest army on the earth at that time. But all of their offensive weapons were meaningless before God. The war chariots, all of their human strength, were destroyed by the power of his might. Now towards the end of the psalm, I imagine another verse in there that many of you, if not all of you, have referenced many a time, and it's this, be still and know that I am God. And the word for be still here means take your hands off and just relax. I think I say that to my oldest daughter a few times. Just chill is my word for it. Just stop, relax your body, and just think about what's, you know, be still. You guys have gotten witness to our son as well. He has a hard time being still, constantly in motion. But to be still is to just let go. Stop trying to control everything that's going on in your life. God knows what he is doing, and his timing is perfect. And when it's all over, he will be exalted, and you will be blessed. So if you find yourself nervous or fidgety, or maybe you find yourself saying, yeah, I know, Pastor, God knows the timing that's best, but that's not my timing, and he needs to change his timing so that it fits more with what I want to do. We want to interfere with God's plans for our lives, don't we? We want to do things our way. But when you find yourself in that position, I want you to think about three things, three commands or three appeals. First, be still. And when you find yourself struggling to be still and you just you have to get up on your feet, then stand up and stand still. And then as you're standing there and you're thinking about what to do next, I'm going to encourage you to sit back down and sit still. Find rest before you try to rush off and do things on your own. Because God wants us to stop struggling and to find the peace that faith brings. And that peace can only be experienced when God comes into your life and is, is made Lord of your life. 
that we surrender those things that we think we want and we think we know best and give them to God. It's a feeling of pure joy when we are confront, confronted with a problem and he's the solution. I've been there. I remember when Luke had surgery and I remember looking at that problem and years ago I would have been absolutely devastated and would not have known what to do or how to handle it. But God, over the course of time, has shown me to be the only one with whom I can properly place my trust. And so he gave me peace in that time leading up to and through the surgery and since then. He's not my child. He's God's son. He's God's child. And that it is not my place. I can't control what happens. Even the doctors still have a limited amount of ability to help make things better. And even then, it's temporary. And I can look back at those times and say, God used that in my life individually to point back to his glory and honor. But when you find yourself in that place, it becomes joyful to share that with others as well. Share what you have experienced and say, I want you to see what my God has done. And we can say, you know what, you haven't had, you don't just have to trust my experience. God says, taste and see for yourself. Experience it. You know, it's good for us. What's the hardest thing to do for people in this country? I think one of the hardest things is to to, to sit or stand, whatever, in silence. How much of the day, you know, hang on just a second. Okay, now I know everybody's gotten some silence for the day. How much silence do you get in a normal day? Some may be more than others, but, you know, for some it's, i got to have the radio on if it's silent. I can't have silence. We don't get a whole lot of silence in our household, do we? right now, but, but sometimes it is necessary for us to stand still and watch the mighty hand of God work so that we too will acknowledge what God has done and that he is for us. How powerful is this God that we serve? Well, we know that war and peace depend upon his word and will. We know that the storms of life. The seas are controlled by his very word. He is our great king. And as such, we are called and we must acknowledge the wonderful works. That's what this testimony time is to be about. The glorious, marvelous works that God is working in our lives. And he does these things for two reasons. First, he does it for his glory. He said, be still and know that I am God. His enemies, all those who are not on his side, have not chosen faith in Jesus, need to be still and know, you know what, I am God. I am in charge here, you are not. He will be praised not only by his own people, but by his enemies in the end. It says, all knees will bow. And all tongues will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Men will improve themselves and have their own way and do what they want. But let them know that God will be exalted and he will have his way. He will do his own will and he will glorify his name. And God's own people should also be still. Why? So that when we pray to our Heavenly Father... We have faith in the answer that he gives us. And secondly, he does this, he does these great things for our safety and protection. We know that the Lord of hosts is with us. He is on our side. He is taking our part. He is present with us. He watches over us. He is our refuge. And when we run to him, we can be sure of our safety. All of his children should rejoice in this. They have the presence of God with all his power. Our text this morning said the Lord of hosts 
is with us. God is the Lord of hosts. Because he has the hosts of heaven and earth at his beck and call. And he uses them as he pleases. As his instruments for justice and mercy. God is sovereign. He is supremely the Lord of heaven and earth. But he is also amazingly, incredibly with us. He sides with us. He acts with us. And he has promised he will never leave us. Multitudes may rise up against us, but you don't need to fear them if the Lord of hosts is with you. And if you are a child of God, you are under the protection of a God who is able to help you. He is your God. He is your refuge. He will shelter you through the storms of life. And I promise you that you will be satisfied as you trust him. He will give you peace of mind when many can only find troubles and fears. In conclusion, our text tells us that I will be exalted among the heathen nations. He will be exalted in the whole earth. And this is God's purpose for the earth. We were created for two reasons, to love and to worship God. And the text, as I've already said, reminds us to be still and know that I am God. And if you believe this today, then you can find calm even when the troubles of life arrive. Maybe there aren't storms in your life today. Maybe you say, well, my life's pretty easy right now. But I promise you, if that's the case, there are storms that are brewing just outside. We are living in a mean world, a wicked world. There are convulsions even in, our, in nature today. He tells us to be calm even when we pass through those storms. We remember that Jesus, when he was with the disciples in the storm, what did he do? He fell asleep. And when they aroused him from his sleep, he actually had more trouble calming them than he did the storm. Many of us are like those men. We don't know what is before us. And so we have a very difficult time to wait patiently for him. So I pray that this psalm will be a great blessing in the future and a blessing and a comfort today. And so let me end with this. God can be your refuge and strength and he can help you when you are in trouble. Therefore, don't worry. The Lord of hosts is with you, and the God of Jacob can be your refuge. So be still and know that God is God, that he will be exalted among the heathen, and he will be exalted in the earth, that the Lord of hosts can be with you, the same God that was with Jacob. Now I know that I've been speaking largely to the family of God, but if you do not yet have Christ in your life, I want to just encourage you that this can be uh, an important call to remove ourselves, to turn from the sin that, that we have chosen to, to follow instead of Christ. And there may be someone here this morning that needs to hear the message that where trouble and problems have been found and we have not been able to maybe find an answer, Christ alone is the answer. And just like I have found to be true, you'll never be sorry for choosing Christ. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are our refuge and strength, our, and that you are ever-present, even in times of trouble. Lord, we ask for forgiveness when things arise in our life, when trials arise and we quickly turn inward. We neglect 
to turn to you first, Lord. You have called us to pray without ceasing. Lord, to turn to you first. You, you desire that whether it be through times of praise or times of concern and through trials of life, Lord, that we turn it over to you. Father, we ask for your presence to be made ever clearly in each of our lives as we go forward this week. Lord, we know that we go forth only because of your strength. So give us the courage to share with others the hope that we have found through you. Lord, give us the opportunity to express that hope this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the, the closing song. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live at peace. And may the God of love and peace be with you. And remember, church, this week, as is true every week, you are sent out into your mission field starting right now.